Welcome to Project Brewpeg. My name's Damien. We're converting a sunken fishing trawler into a global expedition and research boat. We're community funded and you can get on board. Today, we're building a bow crane so we can lift heavy things up onto our deck. We're also sticking a whole bunch of water into one of our fuel tanks and pressure testing it. So the crane on the bow needs to pivot, so we went off to the steel suppliers, we got a piece of stainless heavy wall pipe cut so that we can make a rotating pivot. So the plan is to take these three pieces of stainless and make a swivel out of that, and then we're going to weld them onto the bottom of our anchor crane. So the plan is to use our trusty engine crane here and convert it into an anchor crane. So one of the drawbacks of doing this is that shaft on that ram, um, if you can see there I have to fairly routinely give it uh, a polish up with wet and dry, um, it does rust, so it's clearly just mild steel machined. Um, that will need to be swapped out for a stainless shaft, so that's one mod that we'll need to do, but other than that, it's pretty much good to go. So the bottom base here, we're going to obviously need to mount that, weld some gussets in and strengthen it up, but that base is going to be turned into a swivel base, and then that is going to be mounted up on the bow. Given the size of the anchors we're going to be using up on the bow here of Brewpeg, we need a crane that's capable of lifting at least 300-400 kg, something around that level. The anchors are a bit over 100, so they're, I think they're 110 kg uh, for the large one, and probably slightly smaller, maybe 90 for the secondary. Uh, those are too heavy for me to be able to lift around on the bow, so we need something that's going to be able to lift them up, swing them over the side and drop them, uh, if we ever need to change anchors. And we also need something that's capable of lifting gear up and down on the bow if we ever need it. So what we're going to be doing is building a swivel crane right up the front. So on the foredeck it's pretty clear. We've got these two Samson posts on either side that are used to obviously tie the boat off at uh, wharfs and so on. We're going to be utilising one of these as our pivot point. So it's off to one side, which for us is perfect, keeps the foredeck clear, but it also means that we can extend far out over one side if we ever need to. The plan today is to cut the top off this Samson post and that's going to become our swivel area utilising those three pieces of stainless I showed you just before. I want you coming through the door you fill the room with joy I could be a honey pie and save the world on the side Just to see you smile So the plan now that we've got that cut open is these flanges are going to become our swivel so we need to weld one onto the top of that Samson post over there and we need to weld one onto the top of this piece of stainless here and this is going to slide down inside the Samson post and provide our, our vertical strengthening so what I'm thinking, this piece of pipe is going to slide down the centre, it's thick wall, uh, I think it's schedule 40 from memory, but thick wall stainless pipe. Um, we've got these two flanges, now one is slightly thicker than the other, probably doesn't matter in the flange world, but for us um, I just have to sort of think about which one's going to need the most strength. But what I need to do is get these two perfectly parallel when I weld them, and they have to be parallel to this pipe here, so I'm going to build this pipe first, and then the final piece will be welding the flange onto the stamp, uh, Samson post on the boat. I need to sink this piece of tube into this flange but only about halfway so I can get a good weld on it. So my plan is to use this, whatever that is, and sit this pipe on top of it and that's going to lift it up by the thickness of that uh, piece of plastic. So I've got a nice flat piece of bench there, if I throw that down there like that, pipe goes in like that, I can weld it and then know that I'm going to have a gap on the other side which is really critical so I'm only tacking this side and then I'm going to grind those welds off and I'll show you why in a sec, we'll get it welded mostly on the other side.
Okay, so we've got the weld all the way around. You can sort of see there, um, it's pretty butty, but that's all good. What I want to do is these flanges have to run perfectly smooth on each other, and this one here, I was, you can see that there is running quite, quite nicely all the way around. I was a bit worried that when I weld this, it might warp it, um, but filed off all of the dags, and um, yeah, it seems to be really quite flat still because it's quite a thick. It's probably a good 10 mil thick at least. So um, yeah, it's it's quite a chunky, big solid uh, beam, uh, big solid flange, which is perfect for that. It sits that way up and this here gets welded on the underside, this gets welded to the top of the Samson post and slides through like that, if you imagine the Samson post over the outside and then that there is able to spin around on the inside. The trouble is, you can see these two are miles apart, that's because of that tack weld that I put on right at the start, so that one and that one. So I've got to go through now with my grinder and clean that out and completely remove that, make sure there's no slag or anything like that because that's the rubbing surface there on the other face of this here. So um, yeah, we'll get into it now and we'll go and make sure that that's quite lovely. So when that's all welded together, we've got ourselves a nifty little pivot that we can mount our crane on top of. Now we got that bit done, it's time to start chopping up this crane. So in order to mount this up on the bow, I really only need this column here. So I'm going to strip the crane down and then we'll take this bit up and we'll weld it up onto that pivot. on there.
There we have it. So she's mounted. Um, and if you have a look down, you can sort of see those bolt holes all line up, which means we can stick a pin through there and lock it off in a particular position. Um, also means we can bolt it if we really want to make it solid at sea or whatever it may be. What I've got to do now is go through and put some gussets in. So um, I'm thinking of just a couple of gussets on the angles on each of these back corners. So we're going to make some cardboard templates and then we'll cut those out of uh, maybe probably stainless, I'd say. So the crane works very similar to obviously what it did with it as an engine crane. We can spin it round with the pivot and we can jack things up um, and fine tune it as we need the height or whatever it may be. I am thinking about putting a boat winch, like a manual boat winch on this so that I can lift weights from right down low, five, you know, five or six metres down the bottom there and then lift them up onto the deck. Um, but at this stage we don't actually need it to do the anchors. We can spin an anchor right round and drop it over the side. Um, and we just do that with a small piece of rope and then we can cut the rope and the anchor drops. So recently we pressure tested the Ford starboard fuel tank uh, on Brewpeg. Now that we know what we're doing, it took us a while to figure it out the first time, but now we understand what we're doing, we've got three more tanks to go. So this is one of our water tanks up in here. We've got to pressure test that. On the other side of the boat we've got two more. Those tanks are a water tank on this side, and then a second fuel tank at the front. We're using the same system as last time. A collection of irrigation fittings that we've plumbed together to give us a ball valve at the bottom to dump the water when we need to and a 13mm barb so that we can put a hose on the end and know where our water level is. So because we did the fuel tank last time, we're going to do the last remaining fuel tank this time. Um, the reason being is we know what we're doing with the fuel tank, so we're going to get that out of the way and then we're going to move on to the water tanks. Water is a little bit different, um, the fittings are a wee bit different, so we're going to have to learn the first one and then duplicate that on the second. So with that said, let's get stuck into number two tank. In the last tank we tested we used a solid cork gasket and then bonded it on and then to a plate and then stuck the plate over top just like that. We had some issues with leakage around the side not getting enough pressure around the centre area here. So one of our Patreons, Jonathan Baker, came up with a great idea um, and it was to use a smaller gasket. So on the second tank we cut out the same cork gasket and we used an adhesive to basically seal around um, but we've only put it around the centre so that we're going to when we put the plate on like this, hopefully we're going to get a lot more pressure around that edge all the way around this part of it here. Uh, so we'll give that a shot and see if it works.
So we have the same setup as last time, hose coming up over the side, over the rail. Previously it went into that filler neck, but this time we're just going across the boat, all the way up top of the, across the cabin, and into this filler neck here. We've got the same sight glass system running all the way down the side of the boat to our irrigation fittings at the bottom here. Only thing left to do is throw a bit of water in it and see if it holds some pressure. So it seems to be working, we're getting some water flowing into this and staying in the tank. So we've been filling this tank for a couple of hours now actually. So I don't know how much water we've got in there, probably a good couple of thousand litres at least. But you can sort of see that little kink in the light in that pipe. That's our water level. So I don't know, what are we, maybe a foot and a half below the, the water line of Brewpeg. So that means we've got about another, just under about a metre to go in total. So sort of roughly three feet until we get up to that, you can just make out that weld line about a foot and a half above the waterline. So, the waiting game continues. God, we've got to be getting close soon, it's been hours. Oh yeah. Okay, so that waterline there is so close to the weld mark at the top of the tank. Um, it's probably maybe 10 minutes or so because the very, very front of the tank up here, at this end, you can't quite see it in the light here, but that there is slightly higher than the back of the tank, so um, it fills up, it's got a a vent that goes right up to the deck up at that level there um, so the water can essentially get rid of any air bubbles but yeah we are incredibly close to being able to start pressure testing this tank that's what we're after so it's um, full as you can see so what I'm going to do this is the end of my air gun and to Jam that in there like that. Alright, so that should be pretty good. So, let's give it a puff and see if it works. Here's my line. This will move quite wildly even with one or two psi difference. So I just need to let it settle out. Probably about there, isn't it? Okay. So there's my line. So let's just give it a give it a pull. hold that pressure on there the whole time and then go around and have a good look at all the leaks or if they, you know if there are any leaks right. I'm wondering if you can hold that pressure can I get you to do this do that bit yeah all right so while Jess holds the pressure on that tank I'm gonna race around inside the boat and have a look for any leaks that I can find anywhere Okay, so the two areas that it's going to leak is right on the bottom of that plate. I can't see anything coming out. Having a bit of a look all the way around. Can't see any bubbling anywhere. It's all going to come out this bottom edge here, if anything. I can't see anything. Uh, the next spot is, I know, I welded that um, ball valve up on the inside, so theoretically that ball valve, I could take it off and it's okay. Finally, last check, all the way around this outside. So, I can't see anything that's dribbling on this. I took my time and had a real good gander at this, all the way around. I can't see anything at all that was causing any drama. Up in the bottom, and then all the way up that weld there. I was pretty stoked with that. And then finally, right down the very bottom here, where we've got our irrigation fittings, 
that's a bung that we welded in. I can't see any, well sorry, that was a nipple that we welded in to put a bung in there and I can't see any um, dripping or leaks or anything like that coming out of it, out the back end of it there. The original one was mild steel and it was just absolutely toast from rust. Um, so this was a stainless one that we put in. Okay, so that tank's done now. We need to empty the water out of it. We figured out a way to make that water disappear real fast last time when we did the first fuel tank. So we're gonna hook that up and, uh, and get rid of that water. So the way I thought I was gonna be doing it was um, simply ball valve and cracking it off like that. It doesn't work, it takes forever. So, I have a faster way. Slightly wet. Yeah. Let's go leave some air in that tank. These are the fuel breathers from Brewpeak. So you can spin them. If I block that up. You can hear that, it's trying to suck air through there. There's obviously a little leak. And then the pressure is relieved. It's a pretty simple way. I'll pull it apart and show you how these work. So these are pretty grubby. They need a clean. Probably gonna replace the mesh and the rubber and everything because it's pretty old. But right. So you can see it's just basically a threaded rod with a stainless cap on top and a couple of stainless, I don't know, probably eight, eight mil bar, something like that, welded in so that they can stick this mesh in. They've got a rubber O-ring all the way around this flat plate. And then this is just a cap that has been welded all the way around. So you can see there's welds in the center where they put that, that pin in, uh, that uh, threaded rod. And then you've got a weld all the way around that they've just rounded over. Really, really simple, but super effective way of doing a breather. Um, and some of the old trawler guys gave us some hints about when we go to sea and we've got you know full tanks of fuel up the front um, to put a plastic bag over and duct tape around here so that um, this will stop the surge in the tanks but you will get seawater trying to go down into your tank so doing that with a plastic bag basically eliminates um, seawater getting into your breathers and then when you do need to transfer it go up open it up transfer it and then come back and close it and take these up again remember these tanks up the front are storage they're not running tanks so most of the time they're sitting still, whether it's full or empty or whatever, and it's only when you choose to transfer it into the rear tanks at the back that anything happens with these breathers. So it's been a really good weekend. We've got plenty done. Um, a couple of things that I want to do on the crane before we sort of sign off. I'm going to get, uh, she doesn't know this, but I'm going to steal one of Jess's cutting boards and a uh, of about a three, four mil plastic cutting board. I'm going to cut that up into a large washer and sit that between the two stainless faces on the pivot for the crane. Um, I'm also going to put a grease nipple into it and essentially fill that bottom, um, this this here on the crane, I'm going to fill that up with grease so that um, A, it prevents any rust down on the bottom where it's, uh, the stainless is welded to the mild steel, but also it's, um, it's going to make everything slide a lot easier. Uh, and that plastic will hopefully act as a washer that will you know, stop a lot of that grease just spurting out all over the show. Um, and finally, one last thing on the crane is I want to weld a brace. So on the opposite side, I want to put a brace going from here down to the hull. Um, and that'll just stiffen up that mount a lot. Um, at the moment it's strong enough to lift, you know, light stuff 50, 60 kg without even blinking, but um, we need to be able to lift a couple of hundred kg with that thing, so I really want to brace it, so I'll do that in the next few days. Uh, and finally, on the tanks, um, we had a really good result with that second tank, I was really pleased with that. So a couple of um, special thanks that I really want to put out there. So uh, Blackfish, 
Um, in the previous episode, he was talking about how to measure tank PSI using head on a tank. So for every, if you put a pipe on top of a tank and then lift it up 2.3 feet, you'll get a one PSI increase inside that tank. So obviously just keep stacking height on that pipe if you want more and more pressure. So we're gonna go into a bit, bit of maths next time round and we'll actually measure exactly how much PSI we've got at the bottom of the tank and at the top, because it's gonna be different because of the height of the water. Um, and then we'll also know exactly how many PSI we've got because we'll be using that pipe at the top of the tank to, to figure out our water head. Um, Andrew Gray and Will Sides also um, had quite a bit to say on this topic as well. They also uh, added into this um, debate about water temperature, so the expansion that'll happen with the temperature change during the day. Um, so you can have quite a significant um, increase and drop in that pipe, um, in the filler pipe, in order to, you know, once you base it around temperature. So we'll be factoring that in as well. So I'll probably have to measure the temperature of the water once we put it in there so we can really understand, you know, where things are sitting at. Um, so that was really helpful to have uh, that sort of detail put in. Um, Nick Murray, he mentioned some a, a brilliant suggestion and it was around um, pressurising the crash bulkhead. So we found some um, pinholes and some rust leaks and things in the crash bulkhead. Um, we need to get in there and, and, and go back in and deal with that rust. That can't be, you know, we can't be leaving that. Um, so we're going to probably use a similar technique about pressurising that tank to find if there's any more pinholes uh, and then we'll climb back in there, open it up, climb back in and, and start dealing with them. So it was really awesome to, to have that feedback as well. Final topic I want to talk about, uh, we had uh, a couple of people mention recycling the water. So we can't actually recycle the water from these tanks, we would love to, but we can't do it. And the reason being is the paint manufacturer says that in order to get the tanks to be you know, appropriate and safe, for the, in, the, in the water tanks case, uh, food grade safe, and in the fuel tanks case it's not as critical. Um, basically we have to get in there and water blast the tanks, so we have to do that a couple of times to get as much of the surface layer toxins off as possible, and then we have to flush the tanks um, to basically complete full and then complete dump and that takes away the last of the, the gunk and the toxins and so on and they're ready to use. Therefore we can't actually swap it from one tank to the next because we'd end up cross contaminating the tanks. So um, yeah, as much as I'd like to recycle the water I can't actually do that so that's partly why we have to actually get rid of the water every time we test one of these tanks. Eyes. There's no one left but you and me 